it's really easy to look backwards and, and you know wonder I don't know how we did it you know right. where in the moment you are just doing what you have to do but a lot of the time it was just me with the kids and there were moments where I would be on the couch and I would have one on my shoulder one across my legs and one on each side and all five of us would be crying waiting for grandma to get there and then grandma would get there and it would be okay and we really did have just people out of the kindness of their hearts come to our house multiple times a day, just show up a group of ladies from Shoreline to help feed the babies, to do laundry. Yeah, whatever God puts in front of you, he also gives you what you need to what you need to handle the situation if you'll just pause and listen. Mm -hmm. You know, or ask. Well I just complete reliance on his on his plan and not a worry that whatever we needed, and I'm not saying money or things, but the help, the support has never been lacking. Well, how hard could it really be? I mean, <laughs> I mean how hard could it be to raise four kids at the same time, right? Well, you know, if you've raised one at a time. <laughs> you, you think about it, so many things in life. You know, how, how hard could it be to, to bear a child and to raise a child? You know, my kids, my sons are in their 30s now. I'm still a dad. I'm still in that journey. How, how hard could it be to build an enduring, Jesus-honoring marriage where the two, God says, become one in their thinking, in their lives, in every way possible? I mean, how, how hard could that be? How hard could it be to, to learn a language if you're a student at DLI? How hard could it be to be a, a student and to, to go through three or four or five or six years of advanced education? I mean, how, I mean really, how, how hard is it? How hard could it be to, to serve in our community in some area and, and, some, and some opportunity or within the church? I mean, how, how hard could it be? The answer is really hard. <laughs> The, an the answer is that most things that we look at and imagine are harder than we think. If you ever look at somebody else's job and think, I wish I had their job, it seems so easy, that's only because you don't have their job. <laughs> just, there, there's so many things in life that just, just, just the, the weight of those things, what it takes to do the things, and, and, and oftentimes you say, well, I'm, I'm doing the right thing, I'm in, I'm in God's will. I'm following God's will in this relationship, or as a parent, or as a student, or in my workplace. I think God opened the door for this job, and he called me here, but sometimes it's just hard, and the weight just seems to kind of become so heavy. You're going, can, can I do it anymore? Can I keep pressing on? You know, how, how hard could it be? The answer is incredibly hard. Years ago when my boys were little, I felt a call from God. I, I got a call from the city, but I also felt a call from God. I prayed about it. They said, can you help coach soccer in the AYSO, American Youth Soccer Organization? I thought, well, how hard can that be, right? Um, 11 years and over 20 teams later, with hundreds of Saturdays that were devoted to going to three soccer games and being there with my kids and Having friends call, no, I can't, no, I can't do it. No, I can't go away on that weekend. No, I can't do it. I mean, all the no's that were said just to do that one yes. How hard could it be? I think most things in life, if we knew how hard it would be, if we knew all of it would take at the beginning, we would never do anything. Right? I mean, if you, if you could see in one moment, all oh, it's going to take over the years. And, and the book of Nehemiah it has, has this, this, this awareness that this surprising reality at the weight of the work. If you've been reading through Ezra and Nehemiah and some of the minor prophets that we've assigned to our reading, if you're a visitor here, we do daily reading assignments that kind of, if you read those through the week, then by Sunday, you're all prepared for the Sunday message because you've been reading the scriptures that get you ready for that. So if you've been doing this reading, you've, you've gone through Nehemiah a couple times, through Ezra, and you get a, a sense of the story, but you know, Nehemiah was surprised by the call of God. I mean, he's in Susa, the capital, he has a great job, life's kind of nice, and God calls him to leave there and go rebuild the wall in Jerusalem because, because it's torn down and the people are, are in, in a time of danger. And so he's surprised by the call, and then he's surprised by the conflict. I mean, God's called him to go, no question about it. And every step of the way, people are beating up on him and resisting him and fighting against him. He's like, I mean, I'm in God's will, Isn't things, aren't things supposed to go smoothly? You know, but it's conflict all the way. 
Surprised by the power of prayer. We talked about that last week, that, that every step of the way, Nehemiah discovered, you better be praying every step of the way if you're gonna make it through. And today we're talking about being surprised by the weight of the work. That what it takes to do sometimes the things that God calls you to do. And what might run through your mind, especially if you've watched certain TV preachers and maybe read certain books, what might go through your mind is, well, wait a minute. I've heard preachers, I've heard some preachers say, listen, if you follow Jesus and if you're in his will, everything goes your way. The sea is always calm and still. The road is always smooth and easy. I mean, if you follow Jesus, there's always money in the back, you know, in the bank account, and the pain in your neck goes away, and everything's wonderful. The problem is they're not preaching from this book. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying if somebody has told you that when you commit to follow Jesus, you'll have no struggles and everything will go your way, they're not preaching what the Bible teaches. And Nehemiah's story is a great example of that. Nehemiah is smack dab in the middle of God's will. And it's hard. The weight is, I would say this, the weight that he's carrying is too much for him to handle. But the beauty of following God when you're in his will and the weight becomes too much is that he carries it with you. There's no better place to be where you're sort of under the weight and on your knees and saying, God, I can't do this. And God says, I know you can't. But you're talking to the one who can fill you with power. And we can make it through together. And I think that's what God wants to say to us today. He wants us to look at Nehemiah's surprising story and discover that when the, the weight is on you, and, and my guess is that every person in this worship center today, in the family worship venue, online, every single person says, man, I've had a time or I'm in a time where there's just, man, my heart is heavy, my life is heavy under the weight of something. And I might be right in the middle of God's will, but it's still hard. I want you to think about that area for your life. We'll look more at that in a moment. What's the area that you're carrying a heavy weight right now? And let God's word speak to you. And so Nehemiah's surprising story. If you're a note taker, you're gonna see in your bulletin and also on the Shoreline app if you use the app on your phone for notes, uh, just a place to write some of these things down. If you wanna write them down to remember them later and that might help you as you're journeying through challenging times of life. But the first thing we discover is this. Uh, that facing the professional, political, and personal weight when you're in God's will, Nehemiah discovered he faced professional, political, and personal weight just following God's will. Look with me at Nehemiah chapter 2. In Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we start to hear the story. Just, I want you to notice as I read this. Professional, political, personal weight in three different areas. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I, Nehemiah speaking, I took the wine and gave it to the king. He was the cupbearer for the king. I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, Nehemiah said. If you weren't here the week I preached on this text earlier in the series, he was afraid because kings in those days, if you came into their presence unhappy or sad, they could have you executed. So he says, I was very much afraid when, I, when he realized I was feeling sad because you just didn't bring, you didn't come in and bum the king out. You didn't come in and bring your sadness to the king. You came in happy in the king's presence, right? I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. That's how you greeted kings in those days. May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah literally left his job, a comfortable, good job, working at the, like the, the highest office you could work at in the world at that time, in the king's office basically. He left a comfortable place to take on a harder job. There was a professional weight. He went from a job that he knew that he was good at, that he was trusted by the king, and he left to another place to a job that was gonna be a whole lot harder, and he was right in God's will. Sometimes the weight you feel is professional. He risked his position in the political hierarchy. He, he literally had the ear of the king. The king asked him for advice. But there was a sort, sort of his, his position in the political arena there drops because he not only leaves that area and isn't near the king, and, and there's, no, you know, there's no Zoom meetings, no Skype meetings, there's no FaceTime, there's no phone calls. He's in another part of the world, and people start lying about him, saying he's actually rebelling against the king. So, so there were challenges there in, in the whole political uh, arena because he was in the political world where he worked. 
He also relocated and left everything he knew. There was a personal weight. If you're a person through your business work, through your, if you serve in the military, if you move from place to place, you know the personal weight every time you move. New home, new place, new relationships for your kids, new friends. It, it's, it's heavy. Well, all, now, all of this comes up with Nehemiah, and he hasn't even left Susa, the capital. He's already feeling the weight of what God's calling him to do. And, and, and so, and, and we may say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're saying that Nehemiah followed the will of God. He was right in step with the leading of God's spirit. He was going where God wanted him to go. And it was hard, and it was challenging, and it was heavy. Yes. And, and, and you might say, but wait a minute. I, I sort of have this feeling that if I'm following Jesus, if I'm following God's will the right way, that my life's just supposed to be kind of easy and smooth. But that's not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself, when he explained, here's what it means to follow me. The word disciple means a follower. Jesus said, I want you to know what it means to follow me. So in Matthew chapter 16, this won't be on the screen, but just listen to these words of Jesus. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus was really clear. If you're going to follow me, it's going to be denying things that you kind of want and like but aren't for you anymore. You're going to deny yourself on some stuff. You're going to take up your cross. You're going to every day say, Jesus, I'll follow you even if it means my life. And then every moment, I'm just going to step by step say where Jesus is leading and I'm going to walk in his footsteps. Does that sound easy? And that's, but, but here's what you know. Here's what you know. Every good thing in your life, this really deep and rich and good over time, it costs something. You carried a weight, and God carried you when you couldn't carry the weight. The best things in life mean investing of ourselves and pouring out of ourselves and being filled with God's power to keep walking through. And Nehemiah discovered that, that to be in God's will, it meant, meant professional, political, personal weight. And also, Nehemiah's surprising story, facing the physical weight. It was just, it, his calling from God was just physically hard. It, was, it, it, it weighed on him. Nehemiah, look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. He's now got to the city of Jerusalem. He's going to kind of examine the condition of the wall and what's going on. And so we picked it up at Nehemiah 2, verse 13. He says, by night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate. These are all gates and wells around the city. He's examining the city and the wall, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate, the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. His, his horse couldn't even get through. It was so much rubble and broken down wall. So I went up by the valley, the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered the valley, uh, the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I love this, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any of the others who would be doing the work. I didn't mention to them really. I, by the way, we're going to rebuild this wall, but you're going to be doing the lion's share of the work. But but he goes and examines it and realizes that the, the weight of what it's going to take. You ever been there where you look at a challenge? in front of you, and you go, man, you know, you know parenting, you know, parenting isn't just, uh, the, the average baby born is 7.5 pounds, how much work could a little 7.5 pound little baby be, right, but, you know, and you're, you're, you, you could be in your 70s or 80s, and, and you, if you have kids, you're still a parent, and you still have the weight of prayer and care and trying to love them and care for them, if you're trying to build a marriage, that honors Jesus, there's a, there's a weight to working at this marriage and making what it wants to be. There's points where you go, I don't know if I can keep doing this. But it meant if, when God is in it, when God calls you, you keep pressing on. And, and, and so, so there's this physical, and then in Nehemiah chapter four, verse 10, we read this. Meanwhile, while the people in, uh, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. There's a point along the way where the workers and the people are so exhausted, so tired, there's so much rubble, they're looking at it, it just feels like it can't be done. There's a point where they're like, we're just like, we can't do this anymore. You ever been there? Been there occupationally in your workplace? You ever been there in a relationship that you're working at and trying, but it just, it's just like, I don't know if I have what it takes. 
Have, have you hit that point? I know when I coached, uh, coached youth soccer for 11 years, after three, four, five years, I started sort of saying this prayer, God, could you just call someone else? You know, I just, I'd like my Saturdays back. I'd like, you know, and, and I, I love doing it, but it's like, you know, then you're at eight year, you're nine, you're 10. Finally, when my kids actually got into high school, that's when I really felt like re- God released me and said, okay, you've had that season with your kids. I don't regret one of those days, but in, looking back, but in the moment, there was times where I'm like, man, there was years where I coached two or three different teams. And it was just, but that, I felt called to it. But there were points where it just felt like, man, I've, I've, I've just about had enough, Lord. And, and, and maybe you've been there too. And, and so, so here, here's these, the, the people of God, and here's Nehemiah, and they hit a point where they're just exhausted. There's, there's physical weight. Do you ever, you ever get to the point where just physically you're just going, I don't know if I can keep pushing on with whatever it is. You know, this, this last week has been a great experience for me. I've had an amazing last week. But last Sunday... So I preached here, if you were here at Shoreline, I preached last Sunday, I preached three times, and I love preaching, I love the study and the preparation. I actually, the week I preach, uh, I'll go through the sermon on Monday, m- Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, I take Thursday off, that's my Sabbath day, Friday morning, Saturday, and then Saturday night, and then Sunday morning. So I've gone through the message like seven or eight times before I get to share it with you. So it's really in my heart and in my, so I put, pour my time in, so I had a great weekend last weekend with all of you, and I'm back here preaching three times again today. But between last Sunday and this Sunday, I took a week off. I, I literally took a week of vacation. So you're thinking, well, that's why you look so fresh and perky. Um, <laughs> although my wife tells me I'm usually kind of fresh and perky, but uh, I just have got a lot of energy. I don't do caffeine. I'm just wound up all the time. But, but, let me, but let me tell you about my week. So I took a week off of vacation. So you're saying, okay, then you're probably really refreshed. Let me tell you what my week was like. I did three things that I felt like God called me to do. Here's the first one. I got an opportunity, uh, Colorado Christian University is doing a year focused on evangelism and sharing faith. They called and said, can you come out and spend a day training our entire student body on how to share their faith naturally and do equipping and training with college students. So I flew on Monday to Colorado, got there. I spoke uh, uh, Tuesday morning to all the student body, uh, Tuesday night to a special training thing there's a couple hundred students at. And then I got on a plane Wednesday morning and flew back here. So that was my first thing. I felt called to do that. But it was kind of exhausting by the time I got back here. But now I, I still got from Wednesday till Sunday, right? So I come back and I get in a car with my son Nate, who's moving to Michigan, and we drive together to St. Louis without stopping except for gas and gas station food, which is really wonderful. Uh, and so, but we had, to get, we had to get there in 30 hours because I, I had a plane to catch in, in St. Louis. So we just tag teamed. Had a, and so I felt called. I love being with my son. It was a great time because here's the thing. I'm still a dad. Even though my kids are in their 30s, I'm still their dad. So I felt called it. So I poured it. So that, so that was kind of exhausting. So now that finishes. So there's my third part of my week. Then I got in a plane in St. Louis and I flew through D.C. to Wilmington, North Carolina because my dad moved there a few months ago. And I love my dad. And I miss my dad. And so I felt like and I'm still a son. Even though I'm pushing towards 60, I'm still a, a son. And I want to honor my father. So I flew out to see my dad, and I spent time with him on Friday. We had a four-hour conversation that was so rich. It was one of the best conversations we've had in probably 20 years. It was just wonderful. And then, and then just had a great time with him, saw my sister and her husband, and my sister's husband's father died three days before, so they were going through funeral stuff, so I spent time with them. Went back in the morning, took my dad out to breakfast, spent time with my sibling, my sister and her family, and my dad, and then went back to my dad's place, spent about an hour and a half talking and praying with him. And then I got on a plane to fly from Wilmington to D.C., from D.C. to L.A., from L.A. to Monterey. So I got to D.C., sent a note to my wife. I made it so far. I sent a note to Pastor Sean, because Pastor Sean was supposed to cover this sermon and preach it if I, couldn't make, if I didn't make it back, so if I wasn't back here. Because one time he misplaced his kid, and I covered his preaching. I don't know if you remember that story or not. If you, don't, you can ask someone else about that if you don't know what we're laughing about. But Pastor Sean's son got lost in the wilderness, and he had to go out and find him. And the night, late the night before, he called me, and I said, I'll preach. And I had to take his sermon and preach it. So I said, you owe me one. So anyways, so I sent him a note. I said, I'm in D.C., and I got the plane from D.C. to L.A., but as I land... And what I had told Sean is, if I make it to L.A., I will be here to preach. Because if the, if there's, it's the last flight of the day, and if it doesn't go for some reason, I said, I'll rent a car one way, I'll drive up, I can get here by about 6 in the morning, go to my house, take a shower, come in and preach. So I, so I got to L.A., and I said, you know, I basically showed Sean knew we were all good, right? So I get to L.A., and my, my United app pops up and says, uh, we don't have a crew for your flight. Um, I don't know where they went or what happened, but they said, and uh, they said, so we're going to delay an hour and basically read between the lines, we hope we can find a crew for the plane. And so I I just, so you want to rejoice in the Lord all the time, but I was just like, okay. And so I I went to one of the ladies that that worked for United and I said, okay, so here's the deal. 
if you're gonna go like, wait, maybe you wait an hour and then say, well, wait another hour and then wait another hour and then cancel at like one in the morning or something, then I need to know that now so I can go rent a car and start driving because I gotta be in Monterey. And so she made a phone call and she said, no, they're really confident. <laughs> <laughs> and so I prayed and, uh, and just waited. And about an hour later, a crew showed up. And they flew me home. And I got to sleep in my own bed. I got to bed. I got to, pulled into my driveway at 11.58 last night. And I got a wonderful night of sleep. And I'm all fresh and perky. So, all, but, but here's what I want you to hear. That was my week from last Sunday to this Sunday. It was a vacation week. I took a week off. Um, and I was just living life. I was just, I was just being a dad. And being a son. And trying to teach some college students. But at the end of the week, I'm going, God, I can't. Last night I said, God, if this plane doesn't show up, I don't know if I can make, I don't know if I can make the drive because it's going to be six hours, another six hours without sleep. But God, if, but I know you'll strengthen me. That's just life. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's just living the life that God's called us to live, doing the right things. Can ju- it can be physically exhausting. And, and then and you keep walking through Nehemiah's story. And also facing spirit, the spiritual weight, the weight spiritually. Nehemiah hears this call. Is there a spiritual way to walking in God's ways? Well, look what happens. Nehemiah 1, 4 through 7. He says, when I heard these things, this is when he heard about what's happening in Jerusalem and felt the call of God to be open to go back and rebuild the wall. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants. That's the people in Jerusalem, the people of Israel. Then he says, I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. As God is calling Nehemiah to walk in his will and walk in his ways, he's so close to God that things begin to happen in his heart. He felt the heart of God. Man, walking close to God is hard sometimes because if your heart connects with the heart of God, your heart can break with the heart of God because there's things in this world that break the heart of God. And Nehemiah's heart was broken because God's heart was broken. Sometimes when you get close to God, you feel with the heart of God. That's a good thing, even though there's a weight to it. He's fasting and praying. When you're close to God and getting ready to be on a, on a, on, on, on a kind of a, on a, a task or following God's will, man, praying and fasting is sometimes the thing that's going to prepare you and push you through, but, there, but there's a, a spiritual cost that comes when we walk in obedience. And then he starts to confess, God, I've sinned, my father's sinned, my family's sinned. When you're close to this holy God, you see yourselves as you, yourself as you really are, and you, and you have to understand, God, I, I, I don't come into your presence because I'm worthy. I come into your presence because Jesus is worthy and he's made me clean. But you know who you are. Walking in God's will has a spiritual weight to it. Nehemiah felt that. You've felt that if you walk with Jesus. We all feel that if we walk in his presence. And then, Nehemiah's surprising story facing the relational weight. On top of these other weights, there's a relational weight. Look with me at Nehemiah 6, 5 through 9. Then the fifth time, Sanballat, one of the detractors, one of the troublemakers, now it's a fifth time, sent his aid to me, Nehemiah says, with the same message. And in his hand, it was an unsealed letter in which it was written. And there's all these lies and this deceit that's written about him. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem, another enemy of Nehemiah, Geshem says it's true, of course he would, um, that you and the Jews are pl- plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building this wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king. He would be executed if the king heard that and believed it. You're about to become their king, and you've even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. In other words, Nehemiah is now the king. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. They were probably planning to assassinate him. That was probably their plan. But they said, come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed. Now... Strengthen my hands. God, strengthen my hands. God, I'm, al- I'm already overwhelmed. The weight, the relational weight of all these attacks is just wearying. So here's what I want you to do. We got about 10 more minutes left to look at God's word in Nehemiah. But before we look and think about what this looks like in our lives, I want you to think right now, is there an area of your life, I want you to identify one area, just one, that you know, something you know God's called you to, he's opened the door for, and you're on the path with God. 
But man, right now the weight is just like, man, God, I know I'm called to this marriage, but I don't, it's heavy and it's hard. And if I, you don't give me some power, it's tough, God. I, or, or maybe in, on the parenting journey, you're, you're raising children. Maybe, maybe you've adopted, maybe you're fostering children. Maybe you've born children and you're raising them. And you're saying just, God, I love my kids. I know there's no quitting in this thing, but God, I'm exhausted. This is a hard time. I loved in the testimony Jeannie said, you know, the, so there's a day when she's holding all four of her quads at one time. She's, they're all crying and I'm crying too. And you just go, God, strengthen my hands, right? Maybe, what, what's your place right now that you're in? Or maybe... It's not a thing you're in that you're feeling that weight, but you're heading to some new adventure that you're going, how hard could that be? <laughs> and you gotta prepare yourself to say, God, I wanna be ready for whatever the weight is because to be in God's will doesn't mean it's always smooth sailing. It often means it calls so much out of you that you run out of yourself and you have to rely on God because there's points where you go, God, I don't have the strength, but I know you do. So just quiet your heart for a minute and just say, Lord, what's an area right now that I'm feeling the weight? I know I'm doing the right thing. I know I'm in the right job, the right place, the right relationship, the right ministry, serving in the church, the right volunteer capacity in the community, whatever it is. I know, I'm, I know you open the door. I know I'm in the right place, but God, I'm weary. And just identify that. Or maybe it's, God, there's this new thing on the horizon. And I, th- I believe you've opened the door. I believe you're leading me toward it. And keep that in your mind as we walk through this. Lord, speak to us as we walk one more time through this journey of Nehemiah. So, so just walk with me now through this journey. Okay, learning from Nehemiah. First, you learn to predict the weight. It's about an attitude. You gotta say, hey, if things are hard along the way, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Everybody say that with me. One, two, three. I'm okay with it. That's pretty good. That seemed almost authentic. Um, <laughs> but but to, to say to God, God, I, my, my attitude is not everything's going to be smooth sailing. I'm okay with the fact that there's challenges. I'm okay that the storms come. I'm okay that the road gets rocky. I'm okay with it, God. I understand that's part of following you. And, and so, so just in your own heart right now, think about that area that came to your mind, that area where there's a weight, and say, God, I don't want to be shocked and surprised. I can't believe this is happening. God, I'm okay with it. I, I realize that's part of the journey. And just let him know that. Predict the weight and have the right attitude. I'm okay with it. And then, learning from Nehemiah, prepare for the weight. And I'm talking here now about preparing internally in your heart. Expectation. I'm expecting it. I'm not going to be shocked by the weight. I'm not going to be shocked when things get tough. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to predict it, but I'm going to prepare for it in the sense that I'm saying I'm not going to be shocked or surprised when the battle comes. I love pa- Pastor Dennis, one of our pastors here, when he does a, a Christian celebration of, of marriage, when he does a, the, the, you know, this covenant celebration of marriage at Shoreline, one of the things he always says to the couple, I think it's, the number is three, but he, he'll say to every couple, okay, no, so today's the day, you're getting, we're doing the wedding today, we're doing the celebration today. So I want to let you know something, Dennis will say, three things are going to go wrong today. I guarantee you. So let's have fun looking for them. Let's just have, so something happens, you go, oh, there's one. Oh, there's another one. He says, you might only have two, you might get a bonus fourth one, but generally about three things go wrong on a wedding day. The, the, the idea is prepare for it. Expect it. And then what happens is the couple sort of anticipate through the, oh, what's, what's going to go wrong? And it's kind of coming a little, a little, but have the right outlook. Nehemiah did. We need to. Just say, say I am not going to be shocked when tough things come my way. And then, learning from Nehemiah, plan for the wait. Have a strategy. Say, I'm getting ahead of this. I'm planning for it. You, you mean, I'm gonna, I need to plan for how to have a good marriage. Yes. Read good books, go to great classes, talk to people, learn from wise people. You mean I got a plan for parenting? I thought you just have kids and just you figure it out. Well, that's what a lot of people do. But how about if you plan ahead, think ahead, pray ahead? Nehemiah surveyed the wall. He got all the materials. He told people where they're gonna work. It was an extensive plan to get the job done. Any good thing in life could demand a plan to do it well. It's one of the things in the church that we, we, we talk and pray and plan for things because we want to do things in a way that honors God. Yeah, there's a weight to it, but if you plan well, it can, can kind of lower the weight. I remember when I was coaching in, in, in AYSO and I knew I was, in, I was in it for the duration. And so one of my things, I wanted to teach every kid how to handle a ball well. So I tell all from the youngest teams, I would tell them, okay, when you can do this, when you can take the ball with your foot, right or left foot, roll it, flip it up in the air and kick it one Two, you can use your knees, your shoulders, your head. That's, you know, and you can kick it in there 20 times without hitting the ground. You're going to take your family and you with my family, and we're going to go out to Houseman's to get a flurry or an ice cream or a sundae, whatever treat you want. 
And I said, but you don't get that unless you can juggle it 20 times. Because I told kids this. I said, when you can juggle a ball 20 times, you can juggle it 100 times. And then you'll know where the ball is. You'll have a sense of the ball in the air and how it works, and it changes their ability to play the game. I had all these different little plans with kind of affirmations and different things, and it was amazing how that brought that experience together for those kids because they, because, because they, they understood what the goal was. Plan for the, so it's gonna be challenging, but I'm gonna plan to do whatever it is God's called me to do and do it well. If you're a student, plan to study. Plan the times. Plan when you're gonna turn your TV off, turn your video off, turn your, so, and, and get, get down and do your work. If you're, you know, plan what God's called you to do and do it well. And then, learning from Nehemiah, persevere under the weight. Be unyielding. Say, I am not giving up. If you know what you're doing is God's plan for you, hang in there. Man, you will meet God in the fire. You will meet God under that weight. He will come alongside of you and help lift that with you, the things you could never lift on your own. You're gonna say, I can't believe I made it through, but I know why I did. The power of God was with me and in me. Do you believe that God comes alongside of you in your times of need? Do you believe that? It's not always easy, smooth sailing, but God is with you under the weight and he's lifting it with you. And so persevere. And for some of you right now, you might be on that ragged edge where you're going, man, I don't... I, I believe God's called me to this relationship. God's called me to this job. God's called me to this ministry, whatever it is that God's called you to, but I'm just exhausted. The weight's too much. And say, but God, if this is your call, I'm staying with it. And press forward in the power of Jesus. And then, learning from Nehemiah, praise God for the weight. Make it a lifestyle to say, I'm gonna rejoice in the middle of it. I will rejoice even when things are hard. If you can learn to rejoice in the tough times, then you can rejoice in the good times and the easy times. And if you can't rejoice in the tough times, you're not gonna have a lot of joy because life's gonna have tough times. And Nehemiah along the way, you see Nehemiah at different points giving praise to God, celebrating God's goodness even when it was tough. And then when the wall's done, they have this massive blowout worship celebration. It's like a whole chapter devoted to it. Just praising God, singing, celebrating God's goodness. So learn to celebrate in the midst of the wait. Can you do that? Can, can, can you say, sometimes through tears, and yet, God, I praise you. And yet, God, I thank you that you're with me. Can you celebrate along the way? Praise God for the wait. And then, learning from Nehemiah, passing on the truth about the wait. To have a legacy where you speak the truth to the next generation. Can I speak for a minute to Christian parents, Christian grandparents, Christian aunts and uncles? Don't lie to the next generation and tell them, oh, it's just so easy to follow Jesus. It's always so simple. Follow Jesus, just everything goes your way. Don't sell them that bill of goods because the minute life becomes real, they're gonna walk away because they're gonna think you talked to them about the wrong God. They got something wrong. What you tell the next generation is, whatever God calls you through, he will be with you. And he will be your stronghold and your mighty tower and your strength. And he will. But pass on a legacy of not only living a life that says, when it's tough, I hang in there. When it's tough, I hold to Jesus. When it's tough, I press through. But you call them the next generation. That I get. Let's raise the next generation that understands that, that exactly what Jesus said. That Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, must take up their cross, be willing to die, and follow me every day, follow Jesus. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, for me, Jesus says, will find it. Jesus, that's our prayer. That we would find you and we would find life as we lay our lives down to walk with you. And God, I pray today for my brothers and sisters in this room, in the family worship venue, online. I pray that you would draw near them, that you would be their strength, that the weight of following you, the weight of just life, that maybe, that maybe just just bearing down on them, that they will feel your presence as they cry out and say, God, come next to me. Lift this with me. Carry me through this. God, help us plan well, think well, prepare well, and live a life that even in the tough times, we hold to our faith in you. We pray this in the name of Jesus because he's the one who gives us the power to live the way we know we should live. And we pray this for his glory. And everyone said, amen. amen. Will you